Okay, so let's have a look at character now. Character is a really fun thing to play around with. We're going to look at using shapes to create different types of characters, a hero, a villain, and a sidekick. And then we are going to play around with expression. Sorry, let's do some drawing together. Right, let's have a look at character expression. We're going to start by drawing some heads on our page. So please do draw along with me. Um, let's keep it simple. Let's just make them little eggy heads. We'll start with three. One, two, three. And we're going to try and convey the three um, basic strong emotions. So we're going to work on happy, sad, and angry. Let's start on this left one here. We'll add some little eyes in. We'll keep it simple. We'll just make them little dots. And your choice of nose, whatever type of nose you want to do. I'm going to do a little potato nose. Then let's make this character happy. They're just a little bit happy. So a little smile. And we better give them some ears, I guess. I mean, that's not bad. That is a happy face, but we can make it happier with a few things. One is eyebrows. And I love to get kids to pull the faces that they're trying to draw. And I do an exercise called magic eyebrows where you hold up your fingers like this and you place them over the top of your own eyebrows and then make a really happy face and feel where your eyebrows move to and your eyebrows shoot up. Make a sad face, feel how your eyebrows droop down and make an angry face and feel how your eyebrows meet in the middle. So let's make this character have some nice happy eyebrows and then we can make this character happier by making that smile bigger and we can make them really, really happy by opening the mouth, showing the tongue, adding in some teeth and colouring in that bit in the middle. So they are very happy now. This poor character next door is going to be sad. So we'll do the same eyes and the same nose and a little sad mouth. Because they're sad, their ears are drooping downwards. And we've done our magic eyebrows, so we know that sad eyebrows droop down like this. It's not bad, they are very sad looking, but let's make them sadder. They're so sad that they're starting to close their eyes. Let's really make their mouth open because they're doing this kind of crying and they've got some tears coming down out of their eyes. Oh, tears are exploding over their face and then their nose starts to run and they get really, really sad. Oh, poor character, poor potato head. Then in this last one, they're going to get really angry. So I put the eyes on again. Put the little lumpy nose on and a little jaggedy line, jaggedy line. And of course, for angry, your eyebrows come down and try to touch your nose. So that's not bad. That is an angry character, but we can make them angrier. So let's make them scrunching up their eyes. They're so angry. Let's open this mouth and fill it full of jaggedy teeth. They are so angry. Come back and make these eyebrows even angrier. Their face is starting to go red. There's steam coming out of their ears. So with a few really simple adjustments, we can go from in a character that's like, yeah, it's okay, it's kind of expressing what I want it to express, to being really, really clear. Let's have a look at a couple of other expressions. Let's draw three more little eggy heads. Pop the eyes and noses on them. Um, so this one is going to be feeling a bit sick. Um, I don't know about you, but when I'm sick, I feel a bit sad. So we'll do sad eyebrows. Oh dear, they're a little bit poorly. Oh no. Oh no. Oh. 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 Blah, 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 blah. Um, let's do some ears first and a nose. And this time, let's change those eyes from dots into love hearts and give them some kissy lips and lots of little love hearts around their head. 
So we've got someone who's in love. And then for this last one, hmm, oh I know, let's do sleepy. Pop the little eyes on, pop the little nose on. Let's give them some droopy eyelids. Those eyebrows are just lazily drooping down. This is how I feel in the morning after my bobby's been up all night. And maybe a big yawn. And a little hand there. <sighs> so draw yourself some more eggheads and think about how you could express other emotions. Have fun! I mentioned earlier that um, when I do my storytelling with kids I get them to suggest things to me and I sketch out the basic elements for our storytelling so I'm going to do that for you now and I'm going to pretend that you're offering me suggestions uh, as this is a pre-recorded and not live event. Let's do our koala first. So we've already done a nice little sketch there of our roundy koala and I'll get these basic elements in while uh, we have a think. Uh, we know that this is a oh, strong koala, so those little arms are not going to be good enough. We're going to have to do something a little bit sillier and really make them nice and buff. Give them muscles on muscles on muscles and a six pack. There's their little ears and their nose. There's their fantastic big eyes. These are always really fast drawings. I'm not aiming to create a fully realized, um, perfect drawing at this stage. I think it's far better, especially when people are drawing along with me, to be real and realistic about what I can create in a couple of moments. At this point, I would then ask for suggestions of what the character would wear, and oftentimes, You'd be amazed how often someone will suggest a bikini. So let's give our koala a bikini. There we go. And these legs look a bit weird now, so let's give them some like really muscly. Oh wow, I made them look worse. <laughs> Never mind, we're rolling with it. It's a muscly koala. Um, and they're happy, so let's give them those happy eyebrows. Uh, let's do our... Uh, Clever wombat. Oh wow, that is really just like spinning me out. Those legs and arms are hysterical. So our little square friend. I'm going to make them a bit smaller than strong koala. Oh my gosh, what have I done? Uh, here's their little square ears. Uh, here's their little square body. And their little stumpy legs. <laughs> and stumpy arms. Let's give them some little fingers and toes. Oh, I'm going to have to fix that koala, you guys. It's freaking me out. Uh, here's the nose. <laughs> and they're clever. So often kids will suggest to me that we have a clever character. They wear glasses. Uh, people still associate glasses with cleverness, thank goodness. There we go. And there's their little grumpy mouth and their belly button. And again, I would ask, hey, what's this character wearing? I get top hats a lot for some reason. Um, and also um, suggestions for like really chunky gold jewellery. Uh, so there's our fantastically wonderful clever wombat. And let's get our cupcake friend in there as well. Here's their little pants and their body. I'm making them even tinier because I think it's quite funny to have a villain who's really small. and no arms. They're already wearing their cupcake liner, but what else could they wear? Maybe some fantastic big hoop earrings and a scarf. As I said, I love to go full silliness with my storytelling, but follow your own instincts if you're doing storytelling with kids. They'll respond best to your truest version of yourself when you're storytelling. Man, the cupcake hasn't even got ears. Um, as I said, I need to fix this koala's arms and legs because they're freaking me out. 
So I'm just going to rub them out. Normally I wouldn't rub anything out, um, but you know, this is being recorded, so I don't want that to go on the record. Uh, let's give them just little strong legs like this. There we go. That's better. And there's their little claws and there we go. That's better. <laughs> it was just too weird, you guys. Okay, they've still got the six pack though, so that's good. Um, and maybe a little princess tiara. There we go. Uh, I'm going to add a little shadow underneath them so that they look like they're standing on the ground and not floating off into space. Uh, this stage often gets hysterical and very silly and very fun with suggestions from kids. Uh, I can highly recommend it. Don't feel like you have to be an amazing artist to draw a character. Anyone can draw something fun and silly. Uh, and celebrate the fact if it's not very good. Celebrate that with your students. Uh, the haunted house. Um, I'm going to give it the triangle shape. So I've just sketched down the triangle. There's the outside of the building. The reason I've done this is to get a bit of perspective happening. There's the turret where the attic is going to be. There's a big door. So I'm stretching all of the lines up to the point of that um, triangle. Uh, there's a chimney there. And let's put it on the ground. There's a tree next door, just a little pine tree. And they've also got a TV antenna because they're old school. Yeah, there we go. Or maybe a circle window because I've always wanted to live in a house with a circle window. There is our haunted house. So we know where the characters live. We know what they look like. <laughs> And we've given them some accessories. So there's some things to include on the page in terms of content. Um, oh, that ko koala is going to haunt my dreams. Uh, let's get on with the story. Let's talk about colour and the emotion behind colours. Uh, a colour wheel is a wonderful tool to have uh, to help you pull together colour stories for your visual narrative. I'm going to go with the classic primary colour scheme of yellow, red and blue. And for each of our characters, they're going to have one main colour. And this does the same thing as the shapes. What it does is it helps the viewer navigate the story and know who's what and gives us a little bit of an insight into these characters. For our strong koala, I think they're going to be a bit of a cheeky larrikin kind of a character. And yellow is a wonderful way to convey this. Lots of people have the instant reaction to yellow that it's a happy colour. Of course, depending where on the spectrum you are, whether it's a um, the colour spectrum, whether you've got a warm yellow or a cool yellow, that'll change how you react to it. Because of course, in nature, yellow is a warning colour. This yellow that I've ended up with is a little bit cool for a larrikin, so I'm just going to add a little touch of orange to it in the shadows. Maybe give them an orange nose. So very quickly, I've just painted over the top of my drawing and added in a couple of quick little shadows using these watercolors that I have here. Um, we've got a cute little character ready to go. We know that um, our wombat is a bit of a grouch over here. They're very clever. Um, let's give them an intellectual blue. Here we go. So blues, of course, lots of people respond to blue by saying it's the calm color, but it really depends what blue you've got, whether you've got the blue of the sky on a sunny day, whether you've got the blue of a shadow caused by fluorescent light. It all um, makes you react to it in a different way. There we go. There's our grumpy little clever wombat. And then last but not least, of course, we have this cupcake who is incredibly grouchy. So red is a great color for a grouchy character, often associated as the color of anger. I'm gonna dilute it down a bit and make this cupcake slightly more pink than red, but we'll give them some red here to really drive it up. Uh, a mo monochrome, 
exploration here where we're using tone to create form, make our little characters appear more 3D by using the darks and the lights. And instantly, just with three colors and three shapes, we have characters who are ready to tell their story. I just wanted to quickly mention shape language as it's something that's kind of deeply coded into our brains and affects how we interact with characters on the page. So you can see here we've got a circle, a square and some triangles. Your circle characters are usually your round, friendly, young, bubbly characters. Your square characters, there's two options really. One is that they're really grumpy and have strict boundaries and don't want to interact with anyone. The other is they're often your hero character, the person who's going to rise to the challenge and save the day. And then your triangle characters are often the outsiders. So if your character is a triangle on its base, that means they're a bit outside, but they're a very reliable, dependable character. And if your character is a triangle up on its point, they are really wild and crazy and unstable and you never know what they're going to do next mentioned a color wheel. This is a fun exercise to do and explore color. Uh, it's a way of laying out colors so you know which colors are friends and which colors kind of fight against each other. You can start with a yellow and as I said yellow is often the color of happiness but if it's a really kind of acidy yellow or neon yellow it can push more into the warning sign and the feeling of anxiety. So if you think of those anti-slip signs those are bright yellow for a reason they're meant to catch our attention. Then over in the other corner we're going to make a little pyramid here. We've got red so the color of passion of anger also another warning color. Grab a little bit of blue for the other corner here. Blue can be calm, it can be clinical, it can be intellectual. And then by mixing these colors together, I'm going to lay down a puddle of yellow here and a puddle of yellow here. Cleaning my brush in between. You can hear that little swish of the water. I'm going to mix together a bit of an orange here and get a little tiny drop of blue on my brush and mix together a very lovely green. So you can see with these watercolours I'm laying down the lighter colour first. There's the red. Let's get a little drop of that blue. That blue is like super powerful. And we get this wonderful grey purple colour coming. Oh, too much blue. Quick, add some more red. There we go. So when you're pulling together color palettes for your visual narratives, this is the classic primary colors. These are your complementary colors. If colors are next to each other, those are your best friend colors. They're going to create a very visually pleasing um, story on your page. If you jump across the color wheel, for example, the red to the green, those colors are very exciting next to each other. They're very passionate. They're almost argumentative. Same if you jump from here, from the blue to the purple, it's going to create a really high emotional moment. That's a very quick look at the color wheel. Of course, you can start blending in between these colors as well, but these simple ones are really great and having an understanding of how to mix those colors I think is really valuable to um, anyone who's wanting to make art because uh, you can create boundless um, images from just three colors which I think is spectacular. So we have an idea of who and what and where is at the heart of our story. We may have used magic pop sticks, we might have done some brainstorming. Um, when you're trying to decide what is going to go in your story visually, there's just so much possibility. So you're going to have someone in your story usually. Your story has a character, whether it's an animal or a robot or a sentient plant. Um, and then you kind of need to get to know that character to figure out what they have. What are they wearing? What do they like to do with their hair in the morning? Do they have a pet? Um, 
and then you kind of figure out where it's set. Is the story at home? Is it in a haunted house like our story? Is it on a llama farm? These things will help you figure out what to include in your pictures. And it's nice to give your characters something to do. So are they doing something with their hands? Are they jumping over something? Are there toys in the story? Are they eating? These are a lot of questions to think about when you're building a narrative. So a nice way to get to know a character is to think about what's in their school bag. Do they have a neat and tidy school bag? Do they have a messy school bag? Let's do some drawing for our two characters. Let's find out what is in Koala's school bag and what's in Wombat's school bag. Okay, let's think about what is in Koala and Wombat's school bag. Oh, there goes my camera again. Apologies for the dodgy setup. Um, koala and Wombat. So I think um, someone is going to have a half-eaten sandwich that they didn't like the inside of. Um, there's going to be some trading cards. There's going to be a pencil that's escaped from its pencil case. There's going to be a scrumpled up note that mum was meant to fill in but never got to see. And what else? Oh, a little collection of things. So <clears throat> there's going to be a little collection of stars and planets. So would you say that this one belonged to Koala or Wombat? Hmm. And then in our other school bag, we could have a banana skin that's starting to go brown and slimy. A birthday invitation. And hmm, what would this character collect? I think that this character is going to have a collection of interesting things that they found on the walk to school. So there's a leaf and a gum nut and another leaf because this character really likes leaves. And a gum blossom. And a really cool pen with a pom-pom on the end. So just by having a think what these characters have in their school bags, we've got the potential for lots of story already. So why does Wombat have a collection of planets and stars? Are they an astronomer? Do they like looking up at the moon at night and telling stories about the constellations? What's on these collecting cards? What are they really, really interested in? What was this note for? What excursion did they miss out on? And what was in that sandwich? Tell me more. Then here in Koala's backpack, we've got these beautiful leaves that they collect in case they need a snack. How long has that banana been in there? What's gonna happen when someone smushes their hand into it? And whose party is it? What's gonna happen at that party? So just from this one little quick drawing exercise, we've got heaps of great story ideas that we can pull on and we get to know our characters a little bit better. This is just a little exercise in practicing drawing what you can see. As much as it's great to draw things from our imaginations, we need to understand how the real world works 
in order to be able to draw it properly. So this exercise is about um, taking some time and going really slowly and setting yourself up with a little still life. Um, these are objects from my bag and I'm just going to set them up off screen here a little bit. And a great trick is to use your phone or a torch to give a really strong lighting source. And just kind of move them around until you're really pleased with how everything's looking together. Hmm, maybe I'll pop that there instead. It's good to leave some um, space between your shapes. And then we're going to use our eye as a detective and really, really try and capture the shapes accurately. And you're going to flick your eye back and forth from the objects to your paper, objects to your paper. Um, so I'm going to start with the center of that necklace. Trying to get these beads in a nice formation like they are there. Sketching quite lightly at this point and then the beads sh change shape. So first of all we're getting in the shapes as accurately as we can really taking our time. This can become quite meditative so if you want a nice calming activity for yourself or the kids in your class this is a really beautiful one and then we've got a knot there which is a double knot and this curves away. That's my little bubby in the background being a bit upset about something. Then we've got this wonderful shape of the dummy here So I'm flicking my eye back and forth, checking the proportions, checking the shapes. Of course you can use an eraser to come back and revisit and get the shapes more accurately. Curving around there. So you can see I haven't quite nailed it, um, but I'm going to keep going. We're aiming for it to be as close as possible to what we're looking at, but we're not going to freak out if we've gone a bit astray. And you can keep going until you've captured all of the shapes on your page and then you have the option you can either leave it as a really beautiful line drawing or you can come back and start adding some shades or some tone in. So by pressing a bit more firmly with my pencil I can see the light is coming across this way. It's coming from this lovely window. We've got beautiful grey day today. putting in these shadows first of all. So I like to think in terms of where is the brightest spot and where is the darkest spot and focus on those first. And then you can come back and think about the middle areas. I'm just swirling my pencil in lots of little circles. It's a nice way to color in the tones. And just there you can see I can come back, make those shadows a bit deeper. A 2B pencil is great for this. Wonderful to do with charcoal because then you can get in there and smudge it. And I keep going, keep going, keep going. So this is a lovely exercise to try. Um, I'd love to see your results. Send them through to the awesome team or post them on social media and tag us. Good luck. Composition is a bit more complex and covers a lot of area on your page. Uh, so composition is basically everything in your picture and where you decide to put it. So it covers things like perspective and where is the focus on the page, where do you look first as a reader or a viewer. Uh, it is all about making the page as interesting as possible and getting your reader to either want to hang around on that page and learn as much about the characters and the story as they can or getting them so swept up in the story that they just keep reading and reading and reading and they just never want to leave that story at all. So you know, not much to do at all. 
let's have a look at some of those elements and how you could get your students to play around with composition when they're making their own books. Right. Um, composition is a really interesting one to play with, especially with kids. There's the tendency to just very intuitively put everything down on the page and have it be perfect. But if you want to um, push this a bit further, pull out some of the picture books from your library or your um, classroom collection and start critiquing how the illustrator has laid things out on the page. What are you looking at first? What's the most interesting thing? And then where does your eye go to next? Um, the illustrator has made lots of choices to guide your eye around the picture. You can um, play around with composition digitally, which is what I've done here, again on my iPad using Procreate, or you can print the story elements out at different sizes and cut them out and muck around with placing them on the page in different ways. So here's our first attempt. I have literally just plonked the characters down and the setting down onto the page. It's fine. The information is there, but it's not a very interesting story. So in these next examples, I've been messing around with where the characters are, how big the building is, and whether I need to add any extra story elements. So you can see in this example that I have tucked the giant cupcake behind the house. I've enlarged them so that their relationship with that house tells us more about them. And then we've got the sense of movement because we've got the koala in the foreground and the little wombat off in the background near the house and they've been tilted off to the side so they look like they're running. You could also redraw this of course to give your characters different expressions and different movements. Then I wanted to really push the size of that cupcake so I've enlarged it again, um, moved the little characters and given them a shadow to help them feel like they're in the landscape. Then I wanted to capture the moment where the cupcake is crying and it's raining. So I've added some tears and some umbrellas. And finally, I thought, wouldn't it be great if we really, really pushed the size of that cupcake and made it the size of a mountain, basically. Um, I'm not sure which is my favorite here. I think possibly um, this one where that little um, giant cupcake is peeping out from behind the house. Uh, it gives us lots of opportunity for where to go with the story, I think. And that's really what we're wanting to do. We're wanting to keep people immersed in our story and get them to turn the page to see what happens next. Let's have a quick chat about um, how colour can affect the narrative of your story. So here I've um, taken this um, sketch of our characters in the haunted house and using my iPad and a program called Procreate, I've adjusted the hue and saturation of the image to very quickly give us some different colour palettes. And changing the colour palettes gives us a different story for each one. So our original, I'd chosen a purple background to allow those characters to pop out and also indicate that it was night time and give a slightly spooky vibe to it. Because of the character expression of the cupcake in the background and the way they're lurking there, we still have a little bit of a spooky, um, ooh, something bad might happen uh, narrative going on, but it's different in each of these. So the yellow is giving us the sense of, oh, something not quite right might happen, but everything's gonna be okay, because this is a warm, friendly yellow. The pink, the magenta that we've got here in the background, is a little bit unusual. It's a little bit, something's not quite right and probably slightly more exciting than the purple we had originally. Then we've got the blue, the cyan over on the left and this is um, pretty great because it hides wombat so we don't initially see wombat in the background there and also um, makes our yellow koala the star of the composition and then we flick our eyes back to the cupcake and eventually we find poor wombat back there near the door and start feeling a bit alarmed for them being close to that giant. So this is a really fun easy exercise that you can do lots of programs allow you to adjust hue and saturation um, and it's a great way to demonstrate how 
the emotions of different colours influence our feelings about what's happening in the story.